Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Reimagine 2021 version 9, Game of Change. Uh, this is our ninth event, and uh, this time we're focused on highlighting innovation that's happening, you know, just outside layer one. We're looking at layer two solutions. Uh, we're looking at things like side chains, and it's been really interesting for me uh, speaking to a lot of the entrepreneurs and uh, leaders in the space uh, who are really driving the next generation of mass adoption. I'm Roshan Marachkar, one of your hosts for this event, and I'm very excited to be joined here with a returning guest. Uh, with me here today, I have Lou Kerner, who's the partner at Blockchain Co. Uh, Investors. Lou, welcome back to the show. Really glad to uh, speak to you here today. Uh, and, you know, I, I know we've had you many times on before. Uh, let's just get started with, you know, how, how has the past couple of like six months been for you and your team with the balance of like the bull market and many liquidations? <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, it's it's been great. We obviously uh, went through a long crypto winter. Uh, we believe that you know, we're still in the early days of a of a bull market here, and you know, there's so many exciting things going on in the industry today. Yep, definitely. There's been a lot of uh, changes in just the past couple of years. It's been quite interesting, and I know you work on a variety of different projects and help support the community. Um, but, you know, just to get started, tell us a little bit about blockchain co-investors and what makes you guys different. Sure. Uh, we're a crypto fund to fund. So we're invested uh, today in 25 of the leading crypto VCs around the world. And from a, a, a venture capital standpoint, uh, venture capital is really all about getting the big winners, getting the, you know, Facebook and Microsoft, you know, Googles and the way that you optimize for that, we believe, is uh, by making a lot of bets. And so blockchain co-investors across our 25 VCs, you know, RLPs are invested in more than 300 of the leading blockchain projects uh, uh, in the world. And we think that's a great strategy. We also do one-off investments, um, um, both in SPVs, you know, special purpose vehicles, as well as via our Angelus syndicate. So, you know, if you want to uh, in, invest in one of our deals, you can just become a, a, a syndicate member on AngelList of blockchain co-investors. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting, kind of opening it up to, opening up access to, for more people to uh, participate. And I think that's one thing like DeFi has definitely done uh, or, or, or tried to do. Um, what, what's, what's your view on, you know, uh, what has really been the driver for, I would say, um, more participation and, and adoption um, in this market this time around? Like, how is it different than uh, 2017 is the famous question everyone's asking. Sure. You know, well, well, the difference is, is now really outside of Bitcoin. Uh, there are projects that are scaling uh, that are bringing real value to, to users, you know, really particularly in, in DeFi where things, things like Uniswap uh, get you know really you know massive valuations uh, that we think are well deserved. You know, just like 2017, you know, when there's a lot of easy money to be had, you get a lot of people flocking to the industry, uh, and I think that that's great uh, as long as we realize that you know when the easy money goes away, so will the majority of those people, just like they did. Yeah. In 2018. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Like uh, a, a lot of these, you know, where where there's opportunity, the the yield is good. For example, for a while, uh, but it sort of dries up as everyone kind of uh, rushes to it all at the, all at the same time. Um, and there's definitely been some some issues in the space. People have been talking about, you know, things like front running um, and the market not being as fair. So, you know, from your perspective, how fair do you think? The market is uh, right now. Like, do you think institutions have an edge, or is it still the people? Um, well, look, there's there's definitely front running going on. I think the more uh, the liquid market uh, is, uh, so in some of the kind of larger cap uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, there's a lot less front running going on in some of the smaller ones. Uh, certainly, there's a, a a fair bit of it going on. And. 
and how do you think um like what are some solutions to things like front running is it just in innovation with the actual like code or do you think it's more like a like a governance related issue um yeah i think it can be all of those things um you know i think that you know we've seen already you know, a lot of innovation you know happening you know almost every day um in you know the a amms yeah i'm a, i'm a big fan of bancor uh, and, you know, their solution for impermanent loss. I think that's a big step forward for the industry. And um, like, how, how do we build more of those, I guess, uh, standards in the industry? Like, do you think it will be something that people self-govern and figure out? Or do we need more, do we need each and every uh, individual protocol, like uh, taking responsibility for that? Uh, again, yeah, I, I think it's it's all of the above. Um, you know, I think that you know the companies that continue to innovate and provide value to the users are going to see a lot faster growth, and you see their innovations, you know, imitated, copied, and improved on by others. And I think over time, you know, you'll see industry standards evolve. But you know, things are moving so fast today uh, that nobody's sitting around waiting for industry standards today. Yeah, that's the thing. There's there's not a lot of like documentation or even um, I, I would say like it's not it's not always obvious to to I would say re regular everyday people like for our audience what they should be even uh, doing or, or on these uh, protocols like not just uh, buying or selling. So like kind of from a investor standpoint, what what type what do you look for in in projects and and startups? Like what are your Two, two or three, you know, top things that you look for um, for, for startups now that, that you think will make them successful? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I th obviously, you know, the, the, the team is key. You know, who are the people involved? Uh, what have they done before? Um, you know, the, the great thing, though, about this as well is you see, um, you know, new teams coming in all the time. So, you know, if you're bringing innovation, if you're bringing value, if you're giving users uh, uh, an experience that they can't get someplace else, um, you know, you've got a chance at attracting, you know, a lot of users. Obviously, it's still so complicated today for the vast majority of users. And, you know, even though you've got, you know, projects like Zapper that can make it a lot easier, um, for most people, it's still very, very complex. And so, you know, I'm excited about, you know, over time, this has to get so easy that you don't need any education, right? Nobody got educated on how to use a mobile phone, right? We were just able to pick it up and get massive value from it without understanding even how it works. Uh, and I think, you know, crypto's on the way to getting there, but obviously we're, we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's still, um, there's still some barriers to mass adoption. Everyone always wants to kind of know how, how we solve them, but um, I, I feel like they're the, the same problems that are, you know, repeating or um, getting kind of worse in, in every cycle because you have so much in it, innovation in, in every cycle. But I think the one thing that still kind of lags behind is uh, the educational aspect. So like, how, how do you how do you sort of see the entire market like do you see it as um, uh, like many many protocols sitting on top of each other like like forks or do you think like basically do you think we need individual education for for each protocol or should we uh, you know focus on protocol like ethereum where many projects have built on top of it Sure. Well, I'm, I'm all for education. I think education is, is super important for the industry. And, you know, the easier we make it for people to understand and learn uh, about crypto, the better. Uh, that said, we're not going to educate our way to mass adoption for the simple reason that the vast majority of people don't want to spend time getting educated about crypto. Uh, and, and that's just a fact. You know, if, if you take a look uh, I, I think the internet is a great analogy. You know, the, the, the very first email was sent in 1968, uh, but it wasn't really until, um, you know, the Netscape browser was introduced that made it so easy. Nobody needed to take a lesson to understand how the internet worked. 
Um, and that's, you know, was 1994. And that's when you started seeing people using email, even though the technology had been around for more than 25 years. And so, you know, I think things have sped up a lot since then. So I don't think we're going to have to wait 25 years for mass adoption. But what we have to get is, is a set of tools uh, that make it so easy for people to use that they don't have to get educated. That's the key when we can give a great user experience with great value that they can do without any education, that's when we'll see mass adoption. Yeah, and there's a, there's a couple of products out there that um, at, at least try to give you exposure by, I guess, learning about the te technology first before you even buy anything. Um, definitely a fan of those things. Um, but I think another thing that's not even really an application is just one of the foundations of our industry is stable coins. Um, how, what, a, like, what do you think the current role of stable coins is to like supporting our market and uh, making it more mature? Sure. I mean, what, what I love about stable coins is, is it's incredibly easy for people to understand. Everybody understands, you know, to, to some degree, you know, that a stable coin, you know, most stable coins today are, are trying to replicate the dollars. And you know, successful stable coins like Dai or Circle, um, you know, are are very good at keeping their pegs. And so I think it's most, you know, it's very easy for most people to understand. Oh, I understand what it is when I own Tether. I understand what it is uh, uh, when I own Dai. Um, now actually getting Dai, how they get that is is still complicated. You know, they understand interest. So you know, if people, you know, if we could give people three, five you know, 10% interest, and they could get it easily, um, you know, we would, you know, be mass, um, you know, it, it, there'd be mass acceptance, but it's still so complicated. People want those returns, uh, but it's so hard to get them today for most people. Uh, and people don't understand also how they're getting it. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a uh, you know, people think it's much riskier than I think it is. It is, you know, there are some risks associated with it, but I think uh, uh, most people who don't understand crypto think the risks are much greater than they are. Yeah, for sure. And there's, there's all, you know, there's all the types of, there's different types of risks. And I feel like people don't, um, are, are not very good at natively like breaking apart the, the differences. Can you, Explain some of the, the current risks that you think, um, you know, exist as opposed to maybe a couple of years ago, like what, how has the risk profile changed? Well, sure. Well, as things become more interdependent, uh, uh, you know, you get things like flash loans, right, that now, you know, have, have been used to you know, uh, uh, drive exploits, uh, you know, in multiple projects. Right, and that's a, a, a level of complexity that's so far beyond the average person to, to, to understand and appreciate. Um, yeah, we're early days, we're gonna see a lot more exploits, we're gonna see a lot more hacks, uh, and, and that's fine. Uh, you know, th those are all growing pains. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's about getting somewhere where people uh, you know, can know that, uh, you know th that the risks are really minimal. Um, that, you know, and again, but I, I think even greater than the risk is the ease of use. Yeah, and that, you know, that, you know, when, when people can really easily get their phone and use their phone and in a couple taps, you know, get into a stable coin and use stable coins, you know, day to day, that's when we'll see mass adoption. Yeah, like sta stable coins definitely have an important um, role in the whole industry, like just getting people in or, um, a less volatile way to give them some crypto exposure. I think, uh, I think it's really great. Um, but, you know, kind of going back to talking about, I guess, institutions and, and, uh, and VCs, what opportunities do you see for, you know, those types of constituents um, in, in a crypto and decentralized market that doesn't really exist in uh, just being a traditional VC? Sure. Well, uh, I don't think we're going to a world that's going to be completely decentralized, uh, you know, and so, 
you know, I think that there's huge opportunity for centralized entities to interact with decentralized entities. And I think it's a way that you know, you're, you're going to get a lot of people in uh, is not, you know, by them holding their own wallet, but by going through entities like a, you know, a GBTC uh, that, you know, buys and holds the Bitcoin for them, you know, in a, in a way that's very easy for most people to, uh, you know, to interact with. It's a NASDAQ traded stock, you know, it's very liquid, um, you know, and so I think that's a, you know, that's a, a very easy way for, for people to get involved. Again, leveraging, you know, a, a centralized finance to get involved in decentralized finance. And so I think the interplay of those is where you're gonna see, you know, most institutional investors be for a, a long while. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. And, you know, when we talk about things like network effects, I feel like crypto is one of those uh, specific things that might have more network effects um, in terms of how these entrepreneurs are, are building these uh, different protocols. But like kind of go for the, for the future outlook of this industry, like, do you believe, um, do you believe we'll have one I, I guess one protocol like like Ethereum uh, that's used as like a settlement layer, or do you think we'll have many more side chains and like the new people that are coming in are going to use um, those technologies first? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that whatever it's going to be is different than when anybody thinks it's going to be. Right? Nobody in 1993 and 1994 was talking about Facebook or Google. Right, those were things that people couldn't even imagine then. And that's where we are today. We're in the very, very, very early days of the biggest thing to happen in the history of humanity. Uh, and what it's gonna be uh, is, you know, the, the only thing I'm, I'm pretty sure of is it's gonna be huge. Exactly what it is, uh, I don't think anybody really knows. Yeah, and that's why you know, I think blockchain co-investors is such a great way for people uh, to deploy capital in the space in terms of investing in you know, more than 300 uh, uh, crypto projects. And so you know, to some degree, I describe this period as similar to the, 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 the Cambrian period. So there's something called the Cambrian explosion about 500 million years ago, where we got, you know, we went from really a bunch of single cell, you know, uh, amoebas to, you know, this massive number of new uh, 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 forms of life. And it was an incredibly you know, exciting period. Uh, and, but most of those new forms of life died out. But the ones uh, uh, that came out of that period, the ones that survived, uh, a lot of those are, you know, were truly, truly epic. And I think that's where we are today. I think we're seeing this Cambrian explosion of new projects emerge. And most of them you know, will die out. But the ones that remain, uh, you know, I think are going to be you know, uh, massive, massive home runs. So I think you can make a lot of bets. Uh, and if you can capture one or two of those massive home runs, uh, you're going to do extraordinarily well. Yeah, and I think we're already beginning to um, see that with the way the, the market is responding to, I guess, like new people getting in and not exactly going for those uh, top hardcore crypto protocols that everyone is so uh, used to using. Um, so you, you're right, we can't really uh, predict at all. Uh, but I think, I feel like one thing since the beginning that people always could kind of predict or used as a strong indicator was uh, community. So how do you think community is, you know, driving retention for, you know, these top blockchain protocols? Sure. Well, yeah, as you know, I'm a, I'm a, believe the community is really the, the central element of, of crypto. And it's really, you know, when, when I got excited about crypto, what excited me was this new set of tools we had, you know, blockchain, smart contracts, cryptocurrency, zero knowledge proof, that in combination are enabling all kinds of new ways of doing business, the, the, the most exciting way being, you know, in, in a decentralized fashion. And so for the first time, we could actually solve for the community, instead of, you know, up until now, we've always been solving effectively for the man in the middle. Um, and, you know, but, you know, it's still super early days in understanding how you optimize community, understand how you govern community. You know, so we're seeing uh, uh, 
a lot of innovation in the DAO space, you know, but it's still very, very early. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, the other part of community is community incentives and token economics. You know, and again, we're early days there, but we're starting to see a lot of progress as well in terms of you know, projects that are doing a good job of rewarding their community um, and creating this flywheel. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's kind of different this time around in this market because um, you know, it's not just about like buying and selling activity. You can actually do other things like staking and, and voting, uh, which you couldn't really before. So do you think in general, like this whole governance structure for, for a lot of these blockchain protocols, do you think they're, they're working or do you think there's like some issues than you know things being equal like is the voting system actually working sure I, I mean i think you know they're working but they're still uh you know for the most part uh you know really basic you know as you know we develop more and more complex decentralized organization you know we're going to need uh to have you know new governance tools uh or a better understanding of governance tools uh to to, to really enable that Yeah, for sure. It's still it's still a little experimentary, and okay. and sometimes even there's even a cost associated with things like uh, voting. So I'm not sure if it's uh, fully equal yet, but hopefully more proof of stake protocols will um, kind of equal things out. But you know, going back to like, but also you know, I I would point out that you know to the degree that we're competing against centralized entities, right? The idea isn't you know there's no panacea. Right. This is about what trade-offs do you want uh, to, 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 to accept? And to the degree that we're competing against centralized entities, uh, the trade-offs there are very significant. There's no panacea there. So, you know, all we have to do is, is, is get better than these, you know, horrifically run, uh, you know, centralized entities. And when I say horrifically run, I think they're run great for the, you know, quite often, you know, for the employees and shareholders of that entity. But, uh, you know, if you're the customer uh, of Google or, you know, a partner of Google, what you know is Google's going to change the rules uh, and eventually fuck you. <laughs> but now you can be part of, of, of organizations and partners with entity that you know what the rules are. Um, and, you know, I think uh, uh, those are going to have massive advantages, uh, you know, as, as we go on. Yeah, that's actually a great point because I think there, there's like kind of two views in our space. One view is like every, everyone thinks it's like a competition. People are competing with other protocols in the space. But I, there's, you know, there's another framework that's like we all have a common uh, enemy, so to speak, and that's like centralized uh, finance, like really breaking down the, the, the use cases, convincing people um, to, to shift over. So how do you... It, like, is that what you advise on, like, when you see a, a company or, or an entrepreneur, like, what are some of the attributes um, you look for and just maybe not the founder itself, but like kind of uh, cat different categories, like what interests you the most? Uh, you know, what, what interests me the most is using these tools to do things in ways that couldn't be done before. Um, so, you know, I'm less interested in decentralizing Uber or decentralizing Facebook. Turns out those work pretty well. And I think there are advantages to decentralized Ubers and Facebooks, but I don't think that they're so huge that, you know, billions of people are going to leave Facebook tomorrow, you know, to, to do that. Um, but, you know, using these tools, uh, to again, yeah, like you know, one of the recent investments out of our Angelist uh, syndicate is, was in Brain Trust, and Brain Trust is setting up an ecosystem uh, for uh, people to to you know hire uh, uh, you know, uh, developers and engineers um, that have been self vetted by the community, and you know it's yeah, and and they get you know basically the significant majority 
of all of the revenue generated, you know, as opposed to you know, most systems like that, where the person and the entity who gets them the job, you know, takes 20, 30, 50% of the revenue. And, you know, and the vetting uh, is, is done in a much different way. So again, using these tools, creating a set of rules, you know, one of the best descriptions you know, of, of crypto, in my view, is, is rules without rulers. Yeah, uh, can you actually explain that a little uh, more? Like, what do you mean by that? Sure. So, you know, one of the funny things is, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, the naysayers who don't really understand crypto. To them, this seems like the Wild West and that there are no rules and anything goes, um, you know, and it's anarchy. And in my view, it's the exact opposite. You know, the way the real world works is, is you know, there's a lot of anarchy there, right? You know, you, you don't know what the rules are. You don't know what's going on, right? You know, what, you know, for the in the U.S., how much money is the Fed going to print today? We do not know. They do not tell us. It's anarchy. How much are they going to print next year? We don't know. It's anarchy. Um, but in crypto, you know, we know exactly how much Bitcoin is going to be mined next year. So this is, you know, so there are rules, right? You know, it's not anarchy. There are rules. The only difference is there aren't rulers. There's nobody up at the top telling you the way it's going to be. And the thing about all rulers is, is eventually uh, they change the rules uh, because they can, right? That's what everybody does. If you can change the rules to benefit yourself, that's what people do. You know, there are some benevolent dictators in the world, but not many. Got you. Yeah, that, that, makes, that makes more sense. And I think that's a pretty accurate uh, way to describe our, our industry like we're, we're operating in this sandbox sometimes and it's like it's not clear where the where the edges are but there definitely are rules and, and structure as the the market um, evolves um, one thing that I've always found interesting you know when we're talking about things like DeFi is the amount of roles and responsibilities that that you can even have so for example when you're when you're staking and you're actually an, an LP provider, um, I feel like in the traditional world, for someone to even do those same mechanisms, the, the requirements are so much higher. So are you also like, do you also think this, this is going to bleed into the, uh, the, the VC world as well? Like maybe there, there'll be more protocols uh, trying to disrupt like venture capital specifically and, and have like a different LP structure? Sure. I mean, there already exists. Meta Cartel Ventures is great, right? It's a, you know, it's a community run venture firm and you know, they uh, are, are in a lot of great deals uh, because people want them in because it's the community and by getting them involved, it's really like the good housekeeping seal of approval in the industry if Meta Cartel uh, is invested because you know the the you know they're incredibly smart uh, LPs. There are lots of them, uh, and I think it's you know it's just the beginning. Yeah, and um, like, do you also? Well, well, here here's an interesting question. Do you think that um, like LPs in the traditional world will also be interested in in trying to be uh, like LPs? In, in the DeFi world, um, like, do you, do you think more institutions will start to have more exposure through participation and, and not just like buying and selling? Uh, well, I'm not sorry when you say participation. So I guess participation, like actually, um, like things like run, running nodes or actually providing liquidity on um, some, some of these protocols and, and maybe even doing things like yield farming. Sure, undoubtedly, as it gets easier, uh, as the risks are better understood, um, you know, institutions are coming. It's like gravity. Uh, yeah, it, uh, if you look back, uh, it's a little reminiscent to me of uh, junk bonds. So there didn't used to be junk bonds, and then Michael Milken created junk bonds in the late seventies. And every other investment bank other than Drexel Burnham said that they were garbage and they would never get involved with them. You know, it's rat poison. <laughs> and, you know, now here we are 40 years later and 100% of the investment banks do it. And it's just like everything else. And I think, you know, that's where crypto is, is, is heading. It's not going to get there today or tomorrow, but in 40 years, it's just going to be another thing on the shelf. Uh, yeah, it handled exactly, you know, like everything else. Is, is handled. 
So you think the majority of the in industry is going to be um, institutionalized? Do you think there's anything that, that won't be? Like any product uh, categories that it'll take a very long time for institutions to, to catch on or even, uh, you know, process? Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, what, uh, how much uh, in 2019, you know, what percentage of, of U.S. retail sales do you think uh, uh, were sold online in 2019? I would say like over 80%. Yeah. So that's a common answer. The, 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 the true answer is 10%. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So 25 years in, it was just 10 percent. Now, it seemed like a lot more than that to you and me because you know, we're probably at 80 percent of our buys are online, you know, but not, you know, you know, not most of the United States. Right. Most people, you know, cars and food you know, are huge expenses that are, are still not online. So, you know, it, 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 it's hard to predict, you know, where they're going to be the first industries. It really looks like finance. You know, I liken finance to print in uh in the internet print was really the the first industry that was significantly disrupted by the internet and i think finance is, looks like it's going to be the first industry to be significantly disrupted by crypto but over time i think every industry is going to get meaningfully disrupted um but over time the move the world moves slowly you know if we're you know a 20 percent of uh of of you know finance uh in 25 years that would be um, you know, I, I think that would be a, a great accomplishment. Maybe we'll be more than that. Um, but you know, that's where, uh, um, you know, that, that would be double where internet sales were. <laughs> so that seems to be, you know, to me to be a, a, a pretty aggressive target. Yeah. You said it earlier uh, when you were speaking as well, like now we actually have the, the internet, so it kind of should speed up everything like the good, the good yeah. and the bad. Um, but you know, as, as the market is, as the market is developing, um, do you think that a lot of the issues can, are go, going to be, um, solved by, by the people like, like through open source um, technologies, because there's not, you know, a lot of people don't really talk about things like intellectual property in the space. And I feel like one of the reasons why is because everyone is, uh, building on building or forking on, on you know, previous chains. Um, but what effect do you think that they'll have maybe like from, from a security standpoint, if an institution, you know, tries to gain exposure or, or tries to get involved, but you, you might just have one bug that permeates the, the whole system. Like how, how do we build a better system in that way? Well, I think the system is getting better every day. I liken it to, you know, hacks somewhat to plane crashes. You know, when they you know, first invented the plane, you know, we had a lot of plane crashes, um, but every plane crash would get investigated and generally solved for. So that, that the reason that that, ca that that caused that plane crash wouldn't happen again. Um, and over time, we got fewer and fewer and fewer plane crashes till today, uh, you know, uh, a, a year or two can go by without, you know, major uh, plane crashes. And so, you know, I, I think that's where we're moving to in, in DeFi is, you know, we're still in that early phase where we're seeing a lot of car crashes, but over time, you know, we'll see less and less. Yeah, um, for sure. And I think uh, that that's going to be a majority, maybe uh, community driven. Um, you get more data and uh, more people kind of like auditing the, the projects and more importantly, the code, which is something that... Uh, we definitely need my my last question to you is what are some you know what use cases are you the most excited about uh, for for this year um what use case I'm most excited for this year you know there's you know there's so much going on obviously you know the whole nft space uh, uh, is exploding uh, certainly beyond you know, anybody's wildest expectations uh, and I think NFTs are also an area and collectibles are an area, you know, that has very, very broad global appeal and also what NFTs can be. Again, you know, we're in the very early stages of when an NFT, you know, you know, can be is, you know, we're getting more tools to make them more functional. Uh, so certainly, you know, the NFT space, I think is, is super exciting. Yep, for sure. We've just had early developments there uh, and 
you know, tons of new people getting exposure and, and actually interested in the market. Uh, it's quite fascinating. Um, la- lastly, I just want to give you a chance to, you know, tell us about any up- upcoming updates and like, where can we, uh, you know, stay in touch with you and, and reach out to you? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm Lou at CryptoOracle.io uh, uh, is, is my email address. Yeah, again, you encourage people if they're active on AngelList, come join our AngelList syndicate. Um, you know, I'm a blockchain co-investors, you know, as well. So you can go check out our website at blockchaincoinvestors.io um, and check out a Crypto Mondays, you know, in your city as well. Um, you know, New York hasn't started back up yet, you know, but my guess is we're just a month or two away from that. We're already starting to see some of the Crypto Mondays, uh, you know, start up and, you know, Crypto Mondays Los Angeles, you know, is, is getting big crowds. Crypto Monday Shanghai just started up a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, again, after more than a year. Uh, so uh, it's, it's time to get back out. And again, you know, Bitcoin, uh, BTC Miami, if anybody's down there, well, you know, this probably won't be out before that, <laughs> but that's going to be, you know, a great time. So exciting to see so many people. Yeah, Lou, thank you so much for joining us here uh, again as a returning guest. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And it's very interesting to see the progression of, of thoughts um, and innovation as the market um, evolves. I had a great time speaking with you here today. And, uh, I, and I'll let you all tune back into Reimagine 2021 version 9. And uh, I, I'm your host, Roshan Marashkar. Thank you, Lou. Thank you.